Hi, my name is Benedict for Higher Hertz. In this video, we're looking at the Ensonic SQ80 as reimagined by Arturia as the SQ80V. So that goes into their V range of synths and effects and what have you. Uh, there's, a, there's a really big sales page here that runs through all the amazingness of the SQ80V. As somebody who was there doing things when this synth came out, I must say that some of the things that I see now that it's being represented are not exactly the way everybody viewed this instrument or even instruments at the time. There is a fair amount of revision. This is a thing that happens as each generation comes through. I belonged more to the generation before those who were en masse picking this up. There's a sense through this that this was a pioneering instrument. It sort of was. There were instruments before this, even affordable instruments before this. The Korg DW6 and 8000s uh, were both relying on a short digital sample. Uh, for their oscillators combined with an analog filter. And yep, there were mixed results on, on those fellas as well. I know I had a 6000 and while there were things I wanted to love about it, in reality, it rarely made it to the mix. I remember friends coming to me all excited with their SQ80s and um, I hated them. I just hated them. I found them thin, brittle, um, bad, the bad, all the bad things about digital sound, uh, I just did not like them. They, they, you know, they love their machine and that's fine. But quite honestly, as far as I was concerned, and my go-to at the time was a Casio CZ1000. So it was not about me being anti-digital. It was just that for some reason I did not like this instrument and I was not the only one. But the kids were buying them because they were cheap. They were so much cheaper comparatively in many ways, especially bearing in mind the, you know, the, the more features that they got in them because they were more computerized. Chips were getting cheaper. The, the, the kids absolutely adored them. And, and great, more power to them. Uh, which brings me to the fact that, as I said, it's reimagined by Arturia. Uh, this does not sound like my memory of an SQ80. Uh, but then, nor do most of the synths that people talk about now as having a certain sound, which is invariably you know, built around techno. It's just kind of not how those instruments sounded in the day. So no problems at all, because everybody's going to use their thing the way they use their thing. But some of the marketing is perhaps hyperbole. If you're buying into that and that's the way you want to go, okay, great. But... Arturia's emulations, as others have pointed out, they can make very nice synths, but they're not necessarily accurate to the spirit of the object in the time in which it did exist. They are represented for today's fashion, and that's okay. So there's a lot of a lot of stuff on the site, and by all means, if you're interested, you're going to go through and read that, and so you should. Arturia themselves have become one of the biggest names in the music business without somehow seeming to be the behemoth uh, Roland Korg kind of thing. But at the same time, look, they're, they're into a bit of everything now and they've grown really well and in many ways they probably deserve it. Don't let it be seen that, that I'm trying to rubbish them. My job as a reviewer is to try to look at things well, from both sides now, up and down and all around. And when life's all done, we realize that we do not know life at all. Sorry, Joni Mitchell. <laughs> so lots of keyboards. I've been tempted by their keyboards a few times, but their reason integration wasn't uh, the same as other things. Not saying that's a right or wrong, merely a reason that I didn't end up with one of their keyboards before now. And a, this massive range of emulations so you see they've got, I think it's essentially one, 
one standalone synth now, but all these tons and tons of emulations. They are working to the fashion that I keep talking about, this obsession with uh, these bits of gear that, that have got the GUIs of old gear that somehow seems to, to appeal greatly. I, I spent some time with the CZ-V because of said the CZ-1000 was my thing. That was my start. Um, so I'm not trying to say the things that annoyed me about the CZ-V because I made a whole video as though they annoy me about the, uh, the SQ-80, but there are a lot of the same things because Arturia have their vision, their path, and they have a full right to it. Uh, but it's just that accuracy is not always everything for them. Creating something that's going to sell today is. And that's fine. They're in business. They're, they're doing well for themselves. But there's massive wealth of synths and now of effects, all beautifully designed to look like some piece of gear from yore. Again, good on them. And they, they're, uh, you don't hear about them so much now, but they're drum... Uh, since used to be the thing. I know I was very, very interested in one that I don't know whether it exists anymore, but one that was supposedly had all the all the old vintage um, drum machines in it. Um, so powerful company, powerful product range, an interesting product. Might as well run into my um, my goods and bads now whilst we're at it. The goods, it sounds really nice. And you may have been thinking, I'm not going to say that because I seem to be a bit down on it. No, it sounds very nice. It's practical and easy to use. It's a, it's a synth of the type that if I'd been able to have it in, in 1988, uh, I would have been in love with it. And that doesn't mean that I would have been in love with the SQ80, but the 80V, as I've got it in front of me right now, I would have, I would have been in love with that. It's versatile. But the reason that I would have loved it, and this is a big me thing, is that I could make whole records with that. Just as I did back then, I made whole records with 1CZ. I made whole records with my Emu Emacs 1, and then whole records with my Emu Emacs 2. I loved that whole thing of having one tool and doing everything with the one tool, because you get to know it so much better. And this is one of those instances where I look at the ADV and I go, you know what? I could make whole records with that. And that's a good thing. That, as far as I'm concerned, is, is a really big accolade. Now, I must, to be fair, go through the bads. CPU usage is high, and I don't know why. Let's instance a, a version of it. Uh, where are we? Arturia. Better if I go with instruments. Arturia SQ80V. We don't need the GUI. Let's just turn on our show CPU load. Okay, there's a Thor there in total with other devices pulling 1%. This is pulling 3% before I've pressed a note. Press one note, straight up to five. Three notes, six notes. I'm at 17%. The synth easily hovers at 17 or just over 20%. Just to give you a sense of perspective, similar sound. Three notes, three percent. Six notes, four percent. And that's using Thor with three oscillators and several effects after basically the same sort of architecture. So it's not about, as some people seem to try to say, me saying it's not as good a reason. It's simply saying, yeah, I noticed when I was playing this, it seems to use a lot of CPU. Now, maybe that's the only way to get the result they're getting. I'm not entirely convinced. I just think CPU usage is really high. And that is going to dent my good enough for a whole record uh, because I'm probably going to have to start bouncing things down because if it's using 15, 20%, that means I'm going to get four or five instances of that working away. That's That's low even for one of my tracks. So CP usage may be a problem. I've already covered that I see Arturia as being somewhat dedicated followers of fashion. I think that uh, the instrument itself presents very nicely, There's, but 
this is a lot of wasted real estate. I would probably work more in the other window. But overall, the sand does not remind me at all of an SQ80. Uh, doesn't remind me of anything from that time. Uh, but it does remind me a lot of everything that I hear now. So I, I, I debate how accurate an emulation it really is. Uh, but I sure wouldn't debate how much it's designed to sound like people want it to sound today. The other issue that I've got, we may hit that time or two through this, is their demo time ad. And you may go, oh, well, if you're buying it, why is it an issue? But <laughs> this is an annoyance for me. Um, and also note that I don't have many other negatives. Uh, is that, yes, have demo things feature limit or, or something or other, um, the white noise burst in the Mercury 4. Yeah, no problems with that at all. I, I like that because I can just keep using it. But with the 20 or 30 minute timeout that happens here, the problem is I'm just starting to feel like I'm getting somewhere. It's like, ooh, this is pretty cool. You know, I'm, I'm digging it. And suddenly I'm thrown out. And I can't just reinstance it. I actually have to close my door, at least with reason, I have to close the whole thing, open it up and then instance it again to get a second go. So that to me is, is kind of like a real killer. It makes me less likely to buy the instrument. So there's your, your goods and bads. Mostly though, understand that I think that bar CP usage, uh, it actually makes a lovely one-off synth, either for a first-timer, if they are wanting to invest $200, I think it's 99 at the moment, but $200 is a fair amount to invest. But that said, $200 does get you a lot of synth that if you're gonna really dig your way in and learn it, you'll learn a lot about how synthesis works and you can make whole records out of this thing. And, and that to me is, is a wonderful thing. So a lot done right, couple of things possibly done a little bit less than ideally. Looking at the instrument itself, it presents with three screens. The hardware screen, that's the, oh look, I'm so cool because I've got an old device from kind of screen. And it does have practical simple usage. You can control a certain amount of what's going on from the front panel. And Yep, why not? That sort of wasn't there in the original. It was all buttons and, and menu diving on the original. And it seems pointless to recreate that these days. Uh, you've got the usual modern unison thing. It seems to sound nice. It doesn't seem as, as brutally overdone, but then it's already a very digital sounding synth. So, but I'm not a big fan of Unison, but it's there and it, it does seem to do its job. Um, you've got um, an arpeggiator, which is new. Probably not the sound for this. Uh, doesn't matter. You've all heard arpeggiators before. Do, 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 do. Uh, that's an addition that they've got. Um, <laughs> the old volume slider and the and the floppy disk, which uh, probably wouldn't work when you put it back in again. These these are all just display. They're, they're a waste of screen, but they do make you feel like you're old school, whilst being horribly hipster modern. The um, screen itself is like all modern things, just a little bit too bloody big. Um, it will scale down. One of the problems with these things that are designed to go on like 28K screens and so they're made huge is that they're beautiful and clear when they're huge, but they don't necessarily translate down into practical sizes as easily. I don't know everyone will go on about vector this, that and the other, so therefore it's perfect. I'm talking about practical usage is that it's designed to be big. So it's not necessarily holding up as well when it's small, whereas something that's designed to be small will often embiggen a little bit nicer. Uh, so not a total complaint, not one of those things. It's just, well, it's the, the way things are at the moment. So we've got the synthesis window. This is where I would live. 
and I would probably never use the front panel much at all. Oh, whilst on the front panel there is a hidden panel here that gives you voice expression. Now, being a digital synth, um, I know it was built from cheap components, um, but I don't recall it being unstable in any way, but this is a way of introducing drift. So there are a couple of drift presets, and then you can sort of DIY drift as well. As I say, I'm not aware of there having been any drift in them, uh, despite the fact that, as far as I'm aware, because they were very cheap, they were made of pretty cheap components. Um, Alessis and, um, and Sonic were both building incredibly cheap gear that generally was really good, but <laughs> some things were <laughs> a little... Uh, but, you know, they, they were great for their time in terms of we could afford them and get them and use them. So this screen, you've got your standard layout, you've got three oscillators, voice, general voice controls, one filter, and despite it being a very digital synth, it had an analog filter, but did it have a nice analog filter? I don't think so, uh, but the filter in here does sound very nice. That revisionism is probably good. It's got four envelopes, I don't remember how many there were at the time. Oddly, envelope four is assigned to AMP, whether that was an original thing, I don't know. Personally, it always makes more sense for envelope one to be assigned to AMP, two to filter, and then three and four are glue them to whatever you want to glue them to. That is what it is, it's not going to be a real issue. I've seen other synths that do that. It's it's kind of like a secondary convention, I'd rather the primary convention. Uh, just a general amplifier control, so it gives you your panning and what have you. General tuning, so you can tune, detune the whole synth as you go. Uh, and then a few mixer modes, three LFOs. Three LFOs is, is, is a nice kind of a basic. Uh, you've also then got access to being able to control the, um, the various parameters, so velocity and what have you. It'll even get into MPE, so if you open up the extra thing, you've got MPE options, MIDI controls, you've got these macro knobs down the bottom. Ooh, macros. <laughs> Go watch the Combinator 2 video. And there's even access to, 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 to tutorials. So there's a lot of flexibility and versatility as you grow and understand how to program this beastie better. That's good. Everything has a modulation system, and if you want to, you can just add another modulator. So you click, you say, okay, well, I want to assign, say, mod wheel, and then we raise that. seems to be assigned to a few things but its modulation setup is pretty good and you can oh no you can't keep adding there are only two there don't seem to be any option so most of them have two but no more it's kind of a shame would be nice to be able to have a few more but you can go a very very long way uh, with a reasonably small amount of um, of modulation assignment so this one's assigned to aftertouch So, nice, simple modulation system without getting into a mod matrix. I don't see a mod matrix here at all. Um, I kind of like a mod matrix, but it's going to take up a lot more screen for no great benefit because you can always look at your filter section and go, oh, that's what this is doing. I hover and it tells me what is assigned. If I change the assignment, it's going to tell me what it's assigned to. So that's, that's all really nice stuff. The filter, we might as well stay on the filter for the moment because that's where we're at. Okay, we'll just raise this by hand. How old school? We should actually make sure any of these effects are off. The effects are very modern sounding things. So part of the reason that a lot of Arturia stuff doesn't sound very original is because it's slathered in modern effects. 
hear how this suddenly becomes fairly grainy. That's kind of how this thing felt, only think of that as more harsh, thin, like, like nasty quality paper. It, um, it was a, it was a thing a mother had to love. <laughs> But again, that also comes based upon what oscillator it's being fed. If we go to a basic saw, it's a little less that way, but there will always be that kind of graininess in it. And they've done a fairly good job of, of bringing that through, but it's not quite the same. But I'm trying not to look at this so much as a, this is a synth from 1988, because it absolutely isn't. This is just a modern synth where they've taken their know-how, their componentry, their DSP, and they've laid it out as though it were. And it makes for a nice sound. So your filter is quite nice. It's a little sort of one size fits all, but apart from the fact that it doesn't always seem to go as low as I would hope it went, unless there's something that's upsetting that. Um, I just often feel like, why doesn't it seem to go as low as I would want it to go? Um, and I'm not sure if there's anything causing that to be the case. Maybe I'm missing something. But with no apparent modulation, it just doesn't seem to have a very hard cut. You don't kind of get down to zero. There is key tracking. Obviously, we can roll some off with key tracking. But on its own, it's not the most inspiring filter. However, the same could be said of the um, Emacs 2. I know when I first get it, got it, especially compared to my Emacs 1, which was a Curtis chip, it was a bit like, oh, but I ended up loving that filter. So this filter on its own isn't necessarily the most inspiring, but it will sit in a mix very nicely and not be unruly enough to fight with every other instance of itself. Again, working on the assumption that we were making whole tracks with this one instrument. So it's probably pretty well designed within some of the limits of the original filter, which was definitely not up in the in the Curtis territory for filter isms. That's basically everything there is to know about the, the filter. It's simple, but it would be a very nice, versatile all-rounder of a filter. We can obviously assign it to envelopes and all of that, so maybe we should do one of those. Click the plus button, envelope one. Let's just get rid of the modulation for the moment. Let's assign. Increasing resonance to a, uh, a bit under halfway, as you see here, almost seems to transform it from something that feels like a, a 12 dB or less to something that seems to resemble a little bit more of a 24 dB. So that's a, a thing to consider if it feels like it's too soft. It is able to give a nice form.
Let's try another form that feels like it's not quite. Very linear, but then they've given us exponential forms, apparently. Aha, they don't show themselves redraw. Yeah, how we can get a, a different feel to how that envelope opens. So within the different types of envelopes, and we can actually control them here, it's probably easier, yeah, straight away with the MSEG. So your MSEGs can be used as um, kind of LFO type things as well with loops and what have you. Well, I don't always love the look of, of um, MSEGs, they do provide the most versatility in sound. So that's providing a nice... light blade runnery kind of a brass. So we can see, obviously, we've got four envelopes. They have a mode which is seeming to match that of the original SQ80, where you can change your um, envelope shaping to some extent. An ADSR with a delay on the front, which seems probably the most limited of the lot and then the MSEGs in which you can do cool stuff. That is nice. The fact that they give you all these different envelope options, that's really nice. I, I like the envelopes. If um, AMP was assigned to, to one, much happier. And if um, filter were hard-coded to two, I would like that too. And then we'd have another bonus um, modulation receipt. Getting a little fussy, but the envelopes are really nice. So a combination of envelope and filter, even though the filter is a little, a little bland on its own, is going to provide for a lot of versatility. All right, back after um, restarting Reason and everything. So if you know some settings have changed, that's just because of that. Oscillators. Oscillators were a big thing here. Uh, they provided, uh, sorry, the, the Insonic SQ provided a lot more waveforms than you were traditionally getting access to in a synth. Possibly I was a little less than eager simply because, as I pointed out, I was Flash Harry who um, had, well, a used Emacs One and then a brand spanking new um, $5,000 uh, Emacs Two. So I wasn't fussed about waveforms because I could create all my own and put them all in. So it might have made me a little less than excited when people came to me with like, oh, look, it's got 28 waveforms or whatever, because it was just like, I've got an infinite number of waveforms. The waveforms are essentially all samples, PCM sound. So they were taken from somewhere, maybe created with something like an oscilloscope. They, they, um, they sound rather rather flat and dead compared to what we were getting out of things like, well, go listen to the um, the Mercury 4. So things that, that you know, my generation were, were excited about, which were the uh, the Jupiter 8 and things like that. The uh, These sounded incredibly thin and flat. And the same with that Cork DW, it, it, it sounded horribly thin and flat. But nonetheless, with a bit of care, these waveforms can do things that those Jupiter 8s and what have you couldn't do. And that's where the joy in these kinds of synths came from. So you have a massive grab bag of waveforms. And it does include, if you go through the patches, which we're not going to do here, I'm sure they're everywhere, it does include drum kits. What they were like within the, the original SQ, I don't know. But I, I opened up a couple of the drum patches here and I was like, that is that is rather cool. They don't quite sound as papery as they used to back then, but they, that is pretty cool. So they, they are some nice, very time 
relevant samples. Um, it's not going to give you a full Alessis um, 16 or something or other, but it's, it's, it's kind of cool. So you've got a lot of these waveforms built in. But notice how this brass sand doesn't really sound like brass at all. Electric piano, but like four. really sound like an electric piano at all, but at the same time... A very nice, unique instrument can be built from that. So massive amounts of waves, they've got the, the trans waves. To be honest, I've never really understood the trans waves very well, but they just seem to be waves that transform from one place to another. So they're an early, as far as I'm aware, an early wavetable type situation. So a serum type situation. Although that seems to have some sort of randomness, like it... Uh, So it's scanning through through a wave. These on the surface will generally sound pretty horrible. <laughs> well, that's that's not even that's not even fading. It's it's actually just changing the wavelength by the looks of it. But again, that's fine within within a mix of several of these waveforms together, where they talk about on the site about creating new waves, it's a bit, it's a bit hyperbole. However, when you combine a couple of these things together, let's go find one that's a little more out there. No, voice. Let's make sure. It sounds kind of horrid on its own. But now we've started to get a nice sound. So it's the combining them that we're not creating a new wave. We are simply doing what we always used to do with synthesis, but we've got more complex starting points, which move differently because they're not being modulated in an analog type of style. We've got this digital waveform and then we're doing things like stretching it. We're creating a different style of sound creation. And yeah, it sounds wrong on its own, but once you put a few together and have them moving, uh, that's one, so we probably need a different, uh, a different source for that. We create this new sense of an organic sound that, yeah, we probably don't accept it as real, but it's not meant to be accepted as real. It's meant to be accepted as real in its situation. That's what I mean, organic. Then we get nice results. It's a different form from the, the old Model D style of synthesis, but you can layer up three of these things. Let's see what we've got in the, the hidden waves. I need to turn that up, turn whatever that is off. I 
I remember reading the story on these, but I don't remember it very well. Not particularly concerned one way or another. Let's pull that back up. Oh, they are detuned slightly. Definitely hear that that sort of digital grit there that's coming through. So if we turn this into a pad sound, maybe not that long. Then we get quite a nice result. Let's do something to this fella. To click on this. Let's forget that. Let's say LFO3. Maybe a little less of that. So that's most of the synth. So let's just go back and make sure that we haven't really missed anything. Well, your LFOs, well, they're just to be expected. Your LFOs are go faster, go slower. You can tune, you can set their tuning based on hertz. Thank God it's hertz. Uh, sync, sync to triplets, sync to dot, dotted. Um, again, I'm always going to say, please avoid sync wherever possible. It's unnatural. And you can set an overall level. So where LFO 1's being used, which is here. If I turn its overall level down, you see the amount of travel reduces. It's all very visual, which is nice. So you've got three of those that they all seem to be really the same. You can run them as polyphonic. Oh, you can humanize them so you can loosen up LFO behavior. I don't know whether that was there on, on the original SQ, but not a bad thing, not a bad thing at all. Your reset will just be that it resets itself on every note on. Some sounds really benefit from that. A lot of sounds do not benefit from that. Okay, so humanizing and Poly, oh yeah, they can exist together. So, now let's look at effects. They come with a lot of effects. So you've got the ability to obviously have them off, reverb, a couple of different types of delays, um, chorus, the Juno style chorus, a flanger, phaser, overdrive, compressor and multi-compressor. Um, yeah, okay, a uh, bit crusher filters, EQs, and what have you. Uh, so th there's a good a good op pile of options there. So let's start with this flanger that's here already. Oh, you can copy effects from one slot to another. Um, not a thing you're always gonna do, but handy. It's good that you have the option to turn it back to mono because while stereo sounds great on its own you can end up with a lot of problems with a mix with everything got very stereo choruses and what have you okay so you can choose between positive or, or negative polarity it just changes the phasiness the, the comb filteriness of it And you can change your LFO waveform, which doesn't always seem to make a difference, but there'll be times where you feel like, yeah, this is just wrong, you'll swap it and it'll be right.
definitely has its charms. It's quite different from what I was using at the time, which was uh, an Ibanez, a yellow pedal, apparently they're quite famous, uh, but I've never heard anything that sounds like that thing, and definitely never in digital have I heard anything that sounds like that. I remember when I got my LS Quadroverb, uh, and I was like, oh, Blanger, and it just wasn't the equal of that pedal. It didn't hiss like the pedal, but <laughs> it uh, wasn't the equal of it. Uh, we've got this Juno chorus, which is obviously a multi-voiced chorus. And you can hear how the sound is sort of beefing up. The problem I have with these effects is the same problem I have with inbuilt effects really on everything, is that they just tend to be, shall we say, thin, lacking in character. Yes, the sound sounds better, when you use them, and that's nice enough, but when you come to a mix and if you're wanting the sound to seem like a character sound or to have character, then you may find that you want to turn off some of these effects and replace them with more unique effects. At least that's what I tend to do. You know, somebody's got a delay on something and I'm like, get rid of that thing. That, that's just got no feel whatsoever. It's, um, it's kind of like, putting wallpaper on your boyfriend and saying, now he looks better. You know, it, it's it's just not the way it works out in reality. You, know, you want a boyfriend with character, then go find one with character. Uh, but they do sound nice, if not just a little polite. The fact that you can use your modulation system from the synth to modify these is nice. It's possibly going to allow you to add a little bit more character in. But the Juno style chorus should be so fat we're having to turn it down. Instead, it's suffering from being somewhat polite. this reverb. Mix your reverb to what seems like 50 50 with dry, but it doesn't seem like you can mix it to. Oh, hang on, no, you can here. Nice enough, nice enough, which means I should go back and try this Juno chorus again because maybe this mix is. Uh, let's just turn that off. Okay, there, there is more to be had from it. But it still, to me, doesn't sound like a Juno chorus, but then nor is it being fed with a Juno type um, synth and filter. So it's it's possibly poorly named just as that because it gives us expectations for what it's not. It's just a multi-chorus. It's probably a fairer way of naming it. But we put all these things together and I don't remember what effects were on board with the SQ80. I think it was probably none because uh, very few synths at that time came with effects or maybe only a chorus, which was normally a box that added a lot of hiss and, well, not much more. But we do get a nice airy sound. And so long as we're not struggling to make that have character in the mix, then they are workable enough effects. So you could use effects sparingly here to get kind of most of the way there, and then maybe use outboard character effects. 
which are often not those found <laughs> stock inside an instrument or um, stock in your in your door, um, then you, know, you might well find that, that you start to be able to bring those sounds out to, to have even more character. Overall master level, that's nice. It's always there no matter what we're doing. There's no master for turning effects off that I have encountered. You can change the way that effects are routed through some sort of system. Haven't got into it because I think I would probably always be running them in a straight line. But the fact that it's got an option there is, is no doubt nice. Um, I don't recall noticing anything here about your, uh, about your routing. There is a way to take a couple of sources, let's say mod wheel. And there we've stopped. See, this annoys me. Just starting to get into something and then out you go. All right, back again. Gave me a moment. The mixer being under our amplifier section kind of is poorly named. Uh, I know they ran out of space, but when you look into your mod sources, you find mod mixer. It's actually a modulation mixer. So we can take any two modulation sources. And here I've got this mod mixer assigned to our filter. If I take a second LFO, multiply the pair of them together. Not a thing that was new in synthesis at all, because that was the heart of having a big modular synth, you know, a, um, a System 100 or a, a Moog modular or something like that. It's all about doing this kind of stuff. But it is a thing we'd started to lose on pre-built panel synths. So your um, your Juno or, or even the, the Jupiter 4, the Mercury 4 I just reviewed, you, you don't have the ability to take two LFOs and stick them together, other than in that particular instrument, the uh, sample and hold system. Uh, but this was coming back in again with digital. So we've got different ways of creating interesting moving modulation. Crossfade. Lag. So that's providing a sort of a smooth morph between the two. So it's obviously going to be quite influenced. Oh, that's nice. It's providing a filter sweep that isn't as regular as a normal oscillator. So the normal oscillator slit sweep. Yeah, okay. Whereas here, it's, it's different. And blow me down if it doesn't sound like a very nice phaser. Winning. But this is all going to depend on what you feed it. So if we take pressure. So you can take any two modulation sources, glue them together as one through some sort of mathematical process and
bingo, you've got a new modulation source. So we've got a lot of modulation sources in here in reality. We've got um, three envelopes. No doubt you can use envelope four as well. Yeah, you can. So you've got four envelopes, but really three spare because one of them is assigned to amp. Sometimes you want to move your amp and filter at the same time. Um, largely, that's only when you're trying to make TB303 clones, but there are times you do want to do that. Um, we've got your three LFOs, so four, five, six, seven, and then this fella, which can take any two inputs, which is another one, so four, seven, eight, and then our controllers. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. That's 16 control sources. Um, Definitely would be nice to have the option for a few modulation, extra modulation inputs. In most cases, there's there appears to be the space to add probably at least two more to most things. Uh, one thing we don't seem to be able to do is, oh yeah, we can modulate rates. So we can modulate the modulators with each other as well as outside of here. So overall, I think it's, a really nice synth that if you're prepared to spend the money on it and can live with the what seems like really wrong CPU usage um, and maybe there's going to be a bug fix I hope there is it just seems absurd uh, that will make a wonderful learner synth for people because it's so clear here it's a lot more versatile than you might initially think, especially once you move past this interface. You've got a lot of capability in here, a really nice sound. Yes, a filter that initially may seem a little bland, uh, but given the right treatment, the right control, finding how to make nice points, as you saw me stumble there on a beautiful point that brought out that filter as a phaser. Uh, just you just get those moments uh, so it's more than good enough to make whole records lots of records with the one instrument if you're prepared to get in there and really program it and find your own sounds there are presets in here um, yeah okay fine um, you know me I'm just not a fan of of using presets I, I would rather make my sound then use somebody else's, well, that's the clue trade right sound, because then your record don't stand out. The last thing you need is a record that doesn't stand out. Kind of like right now, trying to use the um, Synclavia bell sound to start your song. Spang! Spang! Boo-doo-doo-doo-doo! Beat it! Beat it! Because the moment people hear that, spang! Spang! That's Michael Jackson's sound. Tangerine Dream did use it, but there was enough remove between Tangerine Dream and Michael Jackson. I can't remember offhand who used it first. I think it was Tangerine Dream. They were far more likely to have been using Synclavia before um, Michael Jackson. However, there was enough remove that they that they didn't tread on each other. But watch out for preset usage. While you can think, oh, but that gives me the sound. The problem is you've got the same sound as every other record. Get in there, make your sounds from scratch, come up with something that's, that's yours. It might be quite reminiscent of another sound, but then it's your sound. And that's, that's how you get records that really, really stand out. So as far as I'm concerned, it's a beautiful instrument. I'm going to put aside the fact that it's supposedly a clone of uh, the SQ80 because I don't really believe it is. I think it's reminiscent of. Um, and who cares? It's a lovely instrument. Uh, it's very versatile. It's very practical. It just suffers from a somewhat excessive CPU usage at the moment. Hopefully that's a thing that gets fixed. Failing that, if you like it, then I guess you can just keep freezing your tracks. It's not my preferred way of working. However, there are some real advantages to doing that because you then have to lock in. You can't be coming back later and going, oh, but, 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 I'll just edit that for three more years before it's perfect. You just have to go, that's what I've got now. You put it down and you work out how to make it work and you learn a lot more from that over time. So 
please don't ask me to support the instrument. It's not what uh, we're here at Higher Hertz about, but if you want to ask broad questions about things, happy to see if I can come up with an answer. I'll ask them down below after, of course, hitting the subscribe button and hop on over to highhertz.com and you can subscribe there as well. You have a great day now.